I don't think I'll ever forget the first time I played a three-dimensional video game. It was late 1996 in a kiosk at Walmart, a few weeks before the launch of the N64. Mario was paused in Cool Cool Mountain and locked into the close-up view, and all I had time to do was run around for a minute or two, fumbling with a control stick and getting stuck on a wall. I know this doesn't look like much now, but I was blown away by how far we'd come in just a few years. And to think this was just scratching the surface of what 3D games would be capable of. When I think of a revolution in this industry, the advent of 3D in the fifth generation is always the first thing that comes to mind. But then you compare that to 2013, and another new generation of hardware that, to put it mildly, lacked that oomph. On the contrary, the launch of the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One left me feeling apathetic to the point of boredom. I know 3D itself has been pushed to the brink and it's not going to make a substantial leap like that all the time, but everything I saw for the new systems looked like previous gen games with maybe a dab of polish. Plenty of it was just literally upscaled games from the previous gen. Even the specs were underwhelming, and games were almost immediately bottlenecked to the same upscaled resolutions and bad frame rates that had become the norm on the PS3 and 360. Microsoft tried in vain to at least do something different by locking physical discs to your hardware and letting you play them from other locations as long as you were signed in. Similar to how Steam's DRM has worked for years, and a move that would have, for better or worse, gutted the used video game market. But that move was rejected and ridiculed, Microsoft relented, and so the Xbox One and the PS4 would be differentiated much more by their exclusives than the nuances of their hardware. Unfortunately, true exclusives would be few and far between, as ever-rising development costs combined with similar specs, making it a bonus headed business move for a developer to limit itself to just one console. So in 2013, I skipped the PS4 and Xbox One. Instead, I spent 200 bucks on a mid-tier video card, slapped it into a mid-tier PC that was four years old and still ran circles around both of them, and I think the only multi-platform game that I wanted to play and haven't gotten to was... Destiny, I guess? Between that PC and the Wii U, I've played very nearly every new game I've cared about. Last gen, that wouldn't have worked. PC gamers didn't always get big multi-platform games, and even when they did, shoddy, buggy, rushed ports were frequent, but that's really changed in the past five years. The PC almost always gets multi-platform games nowadays. Even Japanese developers like Konami and Square Enix are releasing on PC, and god-awful ports are so rare they make headlines when they do happen. The PC has become an extremely robust platform, and with the undercooked hardware Microsoft and Sony put out back in 2013, the difference in quality has never been more apparent. It's telling, then, that less than three years later, both companies have announced upgraded hardware. By the end of next year, the PlayStation Neo and the Xbox Scorpio will be... I don't know, kicking off Generation 8.5? Cause see, these are not brand new consoles. They're iterative upgrades of the existing PS4 and Xbox One, but with better specs, able to run games at higher frame rates and resolutions. And at least for the time being, both companies are claiming that neither console will have exclusives to itself. So all your old games will work with the updated hardware, and developers may choose to update them to take advantage of more power. And any games from 2017 and on are still supposed to play on the original 2013 models. They just won't run as well. These iterative upgrades are, on one hand, a sensible move. 2013 was a bit of a turbulent time to be releasing new hardware, but now that 4K is settling in and components are getting cheaper, it does make sense to catch up. The more powerful consoles might even go down in history as sort of signaling the true beginning of this generation. They're coming right when developers have figured out how to make next-gen feel like next-gen, and doing things in gameplay that would not have been possible before. On the other hand... A move like this erodes one of the great advantages that consoles always had over the PC. Let me put it like this. You could be certain that the N64 you bought in 1996 would run any game you put in it just as well as a Nintendo 64 made in 2001. The system was the system was the system. Games would be optimized for that hardware. Developers would learn it inside and out. They'd learn to push it, and the same set of specs that impressed people by doing this would one day be able to run this. Within one console generation, you could go from basic 3D models with Goro shading to fully textured worlds with animated, fully voice acted dialogue. Investing in a console would give you a ton of range. That wasn't true at all on the PC. A top-of-the-line PC running the most advanced games of 1996 would be terribly outdated just two years later, and never could have even hoped to run the games of 2001. So if your primary gaming device is a PS4 or an Xbox One that you spent in excess of $300 on in the past few years, you surely bought it with the expectation that the same rules would apply. 
the system would be the system. But many players in that position are rightly concerned that the games of 2017 and beyond might be even more poorly optimized for their OG hardware than they already have been. And given the evidence, that fear is well-founded. Even having to consider a console upgrade sucks. I know it sucks. And if you're feeling burned right now, I don't blame you. I've seen quite a few console owners saying that if this is how it's going to be, if I'm going to have to upgrade my consoles every few years anyway, why not just build a PC? And <laughs> yeah, I agree, the PC's awesome, and it's no surprise that it's surging so hard. But at the same time, I feel kind of remorseful. This generation probably will see the end of that traditional idea of a video game console. Now, I'm not saying they're dying. To do that would be way too grim, and not to mention clickbaity. Consoles will always have a place. There's always going to be a market for pre-built, ease-of-use, dedicated video game systems, especially when it comes to portables. I guess I'm just sad that, well, that's kind of all they are. Pre-built, easy-to-use PCs with a lockdown library and feature set. As the line between the gaming PC and the game console blurs, and as those consoles become increasingly homogenized, there's less and less of a reason to buy into that walled garden. They're kind of becoming to the industry what America Online was to the internet, and I feel really conflicted about that. But that may be hyperbole, credit where it's due. Sony's showing at this year's E3 was zeroed in on PlayStation exclusives. And like I said, that is still what makes individual consoles worth owning. It's all a bit too narrative focused for me, but if that's more your style, the PS4 is probably worth it by now on the strength of those exclusives. And while Sony is focusing on exclusives to differentiate the PS4, Microsoft might be even more effective by changing its business practices. From now on, if you buy a Microsoft-published game like, say, Sea of Thieves on Xbox One, you'll simultaneously get it on Windows 10, and vice versa. Some have called this a risky move, but I say it's a real savvy one. As long as you're buying their games, Microsoft no longer cares what device you're using to look at the water. I'm looking at the water, Chad. Shut up. Or you might say the company is bending when the wind blows. To suit this shift toward platform agnosticism. Some would argue that agnosticism has been a long time coming. This guy is Trip Hawkins. He was a controversial entrepreneur in the industry, and in no time was this more apparent than the early 90s. Hawkins predicted all the way back then that gaming would be based not on individual pieces of dedicated hardware, but on a more fluid set of specifications. The problem was, of course, he made this claim in the early 90s, and he licensed the 3DO interactive multiplayer accordingly. Of course, at the time it seemed insane, and for that and plenty of other reasons, the 3DO failed miserably. And back then it was insane. After all, just to go back to my earlier example, the N64 was a very different beast from its competitors. As an N64 kid back then, I was like, sure, okay, I get Ocarina of Time, that's great. But if I don't have a PlayStation, I'll be missing out on this crazy awesome stealth action game that everyone's raving about. And that's just one example. Consoles used to have so many differences, and so being a fanboy used to make a little more sense. It was a lot more significant than just a few timed exclusives here and there. The original PlayStation specialized in entirely different genres and styles than the N64. But in every generation since then, game consoles have eroded more and more of that unique identity. People love the Dreamcast to this day for the risks Sega took and the range of unique experiences that can only be had there. I don't expect anyone will ever be as reverent of the Xbox One. But look, it's easy to feel nostalgic for the way things used to be. I want to take off the rose-colored glasses because the truth is, when it's all said and done, a more open platform is a positive thing for us as gamers. People might not revere the modern platforms the way they did the classic ones, but what made those classic platforms great was still the games. And there is no shortage of wonderful games on the market today. Those titles will still stand the test of time. Do you really think it's a bad thing that I felt absolutely no need to drop hundreds of dollars on a small army of game consoles just to keep up with this stuff? A platform agnostic industry benefits everyone, from the developers who need the hardware to be easy to work with, to the gamers who expect that hardware to last. So I guess that's the question, will it last? Well, it'll depend a lot on whether future PS4 and Xbox One games really can be played well on the original 2013 hardware, whether Neo slash Scorpio exclusives, when and if they happen, are properly delineated, and whether Microsoft and Sony can avoid confusing the market by putting out too many badly named iterations of the same core console. If the Neo and Scorpio succeed, I have no doubt we will see new games that are only playable on the upgraded hardware, and we will start getting iterative upgrades every few years. 
Or of course it could fail terribly and deal catastrophic damage to the trust that Sony and Microsoft have worked so hard to earn with gamers. I mean, let's not forget, it wouldn't be the first time a company has bombed trying to sell too many pieces of hardware and then failing to support them. I guess only time will tell, but if you want to take this opportunity to hop on board the PC bandwagon, it has never been a better time.